Dr. Gaines is Assistant Professor of English at Florida State University. She is the author of the new book, Black for a Day, White Fantasies of Race and Empathy, which just came out from the University of North Carolina Press. With a PhD in English and a certificate in African American and African Studies from Duke University, and having been a Carter G. Woodson postdoctoral fellow at the University of Virginia, uh, Dr. Gaines teaches courses in queer theory, African American literature, and culture. She also has a lifelong fandom of Michael Jackson, and this is gonna inform her next work, which is gonna be on black masculinities. So please join me in giving a very cordial welcome to Dr. Alicia Gaines. Thank you very much. I, I really like to give a special thank you to Sarah Juliet for inviting me to University of Tampa, even though um, I think she, she's setting me up for failure here about being the best something something. Um, I'd also like to thank the Department of English and Writing for their sponsorship of my talk today. As an Ohio born and bred Midwesterner, Southern transplant, and even newer Floridian, I have lived in many Souths since 1999. Real question, am I Southern yet? Right, 1999, that's a long time, but y'all, I still say pop. <laughs> um, ultimately, I'm grateful to have this conversation post Irma, and I'm glad to see that everyone here seems safe. Um, I've never felt more like a Floridian than after that last hurricane. So part one of my talk, I have a caveat. This talk entitled, I think it's entitled, Fantasies of Empathy in the Age of Trump. I think that's wrong, even though I made that slide. My bad. Um, it immediately situates this conversation in our seemingly unpre unprecedented sociopolitical moment, although it has um, only been almost 10 months since Donald's inauguration, it is already cliche to tack on in the age of Trump to the titular ends of our research. But it attempts to name, albeit rather glibly, the urgency of our research and scholarship in our current socio-temporal reality, a reactionary age exposing the spurious myth of Obama's hopefully post-racial, but actually most racial administration. However, let me be clear. While I use this cliche today, I do not believe in identifying this moment the wake of 45 as Trump's America. In fact, I emphatically reject that categorization. Yes, a celebrity and entrepreneur named Donald Trump is tweeting, maybe right now, 140 character personal and political missives and directives from either his alleged winter White House and or late night tirades from the Lincoln bedroom as a president of the United States. Yes, it is unsettling when we all roll over to check our social media feeds to read what tr Trump has tweeted next. The social media of Twitter has enabled 45 to 140 us, relegating complex legislation to only a few characters. And yes, it feels new. And while that technology is relatively new, Obama first tweeted as POTUS on May 18, 2015, what some people call Trump's America is actually just our America. Both during his election and throughout this administration, Trump has sent multiple dog whistles, or let's be real, loud and crude dog barks to his base, revealing his reliance on the long stylish pol politics of the Southern strategy. The phrasing of Trump's America tries to make our current moment shockingly new, and is often accompanied by other phrases like, OMG, this is 2017, and hashtag not my America. These disavowals are conveniently bad history invested in the idea that America, anyone's or otherwise, is always progressive and exceptional. That seductive version of America has never been our reality. Q emboldened white supremacists, Confederate defenders, and self-proclaimed neo-Nazis marching in the respectable fashions of 2017 fascism. Creased, or sometimes crumpled khakis, starched or sometimes slouching polos, and mosquito-repelling tiki torches. Unlike their ideological predecessors and contemporaries, these white supremacists were not wearing hoods, 
our white robes as they descended upon Charlottesville, Virginia in August, chanting white lives matter, Jews will not replace us, and blood and soil. These protesters flaunted their bare and very angry faces during their citronella scented hate march, bolstered by the assumptive and later confirmed support of this administration. Their rally over Charlottesville's decision to remove a statue of Robert E. Lee was met with a larger counter protest of anti racist UVA students and city citizens. It turned violent when white nationalist James Alex Field Jr. killed white woman ally Heather D. Heyer by driving his Dodge Challenger into the crowd of counter protesters. He injured at least 19 other people. Social and ma mainstream media immediately heralded Heather as a martyr, and she is. Although social media is often the landscape for anonymous racist and sexist trolling, the white supremacist who pulled on their pleated khaki pants earlier that summer day naively did not realize their bo bold sartorial choice to spew barefaced hate would face any consequences. However, since videos and screenshots of the rally landed in the hands of online social justice warriors, right, they're often dismissed as like a slur now, um, those warriors took the time to identify as many white supremacists present as possible. They reclaimed trolling like Congresswoman Maxine Waters virally reclaimed her time. Some of the identified marchers lost their jobs. Some very famously cried at the thought of prison time. Many of them, probably all of them, wish they had worn hoods. We might want to dismiss this latest performance of white supremacy in Charlottesville as new and seemingly unprecedented. We might want to dismiss this as just part of the South, as if racism and racial terror somehow sprouts from red clay. However, as Dana Nelson and Houston Baker theorize, the South is a convenient symbolic geography. It is national but alien. So this is not the exclusive responsibility of the South. We are all implicated. Part two, good white folk. In the scandal-fueled aftermath of the election of Donald Trump, some of my white friends texted and emailed me, vowing to fight Muslim bans, the deportation of Latinx immigrants, and the threats to escalate the racist policies of law and order. My social media was a visual cacophony of safety pins and pink pussy hats, emblems of resistance, empathy, and seeming allyship. Being seen as a good white person has never, has rarely been more important. So for example, a former white male grad student of mine sent me a private Facebook message. I quote, it in its naive but well-intentioned totality. Hey, that's not his voice. <clears throat> hey, <laughs> since the election, one thing I've been trying to do is check in with as many people as possible, particularly people of color. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate all you've done for me and say that if there's anything I can do as a white man to repay that, please let me know. My best friend from high school texted me on the day of Trump's election, and I'm reading this dramatically because I can hear it dramatically. I can hear her voice in my head. Alicia, I promise with every breath in me, she used to be in theater, I will use my privilege to fight for people like you. Just tell me how. Her mom also wrote me days after via Facebook. Hi, Alicia. I can't believe this. I've been crying for days. I wanted to re reach out to you. Could you provide me with a leading list for white people who are not racist? That's all caps. I, again, imagine the caps, don't see race. I mean, you are my daughter's best friend in high school, and I love you so much, so I know I can't be racist, but now things feel so chaotic and different. I'm so sorry, my vote's for Obama, twice, the caps, exclamation mark. <laughs> and Hillary, caps, exclamation mark, didn't fix things for the people my daughter loves. She opined, oh, Alicia, if only I could know what it was like to be black. If only briefly, I stand to learn so much from you. So, wow, that's a lot. We're going to put a pin on that and come back to unpack all of that in a bit. Let's move on to part three, good white folks' fantasies. So there it is, that haunting, presumptive, racially imaginative desire, I wish I knew what it was like to be black. That wish animates the mostly well-intentioned white folks featured and interrogated in my book, Black for a Day, 
white fantasies of race and empathy. The book contributes to conversations around race, identity, politics, and empathy by constructing a unique genealogy of what I call, quote, empathetic racial impersonation. White liberals walking in the fantasy of black skin under the, under the alibi of cross-racial empathy. Ultimately, Black for a Day exposes the faulty cultural logic placing erroneous faith in the idea that empathy is all white Americans need to do to fix racism. According to Bell Hooks, empathy is an act of, quote, eating the other. She writes, to make oneself vulnerable to the seduction of difference, to seek an encounter with the other, does not require that one relinquish forever one's mainstream positionality. When race and empathy become commodified as resources for pleasure, the culture of specific groups, as well as the bodies of individuals, can be seen as con constituting an alternative playground where members of dominating races, gender, sexual practices, affirm their power over in, in intimate relationships with the other. In the empathy exams, Leslie Jameson bolsters hooks when she writes how empathy comes from the Greek empathia, M into and pathos feeling, a penetration, a kind of travel. It suggests you enter another person's pain as you'd enter another country through immigration and customs, border crossings by way of query. What grows where you are? What are the laws? What animals graze there? She continues, empathy is always perched precariously between gift and invasion. Both Hooks and Jameson prompt some pertinent questions about empathy and impersonation. How do we know what is gift and what is violence? Are, there ever truly, are they ever truly separate in the messiness that is race and its consequences? Is the vicarious curiosity of empathetic racial impersonation always only a representational violence? What does true empathy look like? Is empathy ever enough? Moving far past the mental exercise of casually imagining what blackness might feel like, as my best friend's mother did, the impersonators in Black for a Day physically embodied blackness, albeit temporarily, for empathetic cross-racial understanding. So let's begin with the first one, race briggle. A decade after winning the 1938 Pulitzer Prize for uncovering the links between the Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black and the KKK, Spriggle, na a nationally renowned journalist for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, pitched a new story to his editor. He was confident the idea would again place him in contention for that coveted Pulitzer Prize. Unlike previous assignments like going undercover as a butcher to expose the black market in meat, or posing as an attendant to investigate P Pennsylvania's mental health institutions, this time, Spruill wanted to impersonate not just another person, but also another race. He was no bleeding heart liberal, as he admits, quote, I might as well be honest about this expedition of mine. I wasn't bent upon any crusade. All I saw at first was the possibility of a darn good newspaper story, end quote. After unsuccessfully trying to darken his skin, Spruill shaved his head, donned giant black rimmed glasses, and traded his signature 10-gallon hat and corn cob pipe for an unassuming cap. Beginning in May 1948, Spriggle ate, slept, traveled, and lived black, those are his words, all in service of that supposedly great story. For four weeks, Spriggle encountered and navigated the Jim Crow South as a slightly suntanned but still very light-skinned Northern Visitor, a new black man traveling under the moniker James Rayel Crawford. He traveled with a very specific agenda. As he imagines crisscrossing the South, Spriggle writes, far from journalistic impartiality. Quote, I deliberately sought out the worst that the South could show me in the way of discrimination and oppression of the Negro. I de deliber deliberately sought the evil and the barbarous aspects of the whites South's treatment of the Negro. It is of that only that I write. More than fearing crossing the racial line during his impersonation, Spriggle feared crossing the Mason-Dixon line, navigating the South as a facsimile black man. Spriggle's characterization of the region as a pastoral in blood 
shores up a spurious and uniquely Southern racism. It is a construction of the South I call Dixie Terror. Dixie Terror is an imagined fantasy of the South, making its red soil the font of all American racism, racial terror, black suffering, and black death. Dixie Terror is simultaneously both an uncomfortable and comforting spectacle. And as Spriggle acknowledges in his quest for Southern barbarousness and evil, empathetic racial impersonators perversely seek after Dixie Terror in order to validate their experiences. So they want to go down to the South to extreme the most extreme um, racial violence in order to um, make sure that their memoirs and books sell when they get back up North. While Spriggle sought the worst of the South, the, the South could offer, he did so under the shepherding accompaniment and guidance of civil rights activist John Wesley Dobbs. With Dobbs by his side, Spriggle saw and documented dilapidated sh shape sharecroppers cabins, obviously unequal segregated schools, and women widowed by lynching violence. What he saw but did not experience informed its highly anticipated 21-part series of front page articles for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and his later, very widely panned, 1949 memoir, In the Land of Jim Crow. In the annals of cross-racial empathy, Spriggle is largely ignored. I contend this happens for a few reasons. First off, despite a feverish campaign on his behalf, becoming black James Crawford did not garner Spriggle another Pulitzer Prize or even a nomination. More importantly, before Spriggle boarded the segregated Jim Crow train to Washington, D.C., he knew it would be foolish to travel alone. So as chaperone, Dobbs curated what Spriggle saw and experienced during his weeks as a black man in the South. As he did so, Dobbs trained him to be what Spriggle would call a, quote, good nigger. Spriggle was given a list of do's and don'ts in how to properly navigate Jim Crow segregation. So although Spriggle met different types of black folks and heard all manner of racial terror, all of those barbarous acts he anticipated were only heard secondhand. As a temporary black man, Spriggle himself ne never experienced any Dixie terror to corroborate his anticipated racial fears. However, Although his four weeks as a good black man sheltered him from what he claimed he wanted to experience, that did not stop him from making very sweeping generalizations about blackness. He concluded, very seriously, now I, a white man, and he puts white in quotes, know as well as any white man may what it means to be a black man below the Mason-Dixon line. This knowing goes beyond the perspective of the witness. It is hubris thwarting the intentionality of the ally. This hubris is the corrosive and seductive deception of empathetic racial impersonation. Spriggle's secondhand experience of a stymied bourgeois blackness stands in place of the full spectrum of black Southern life. Here he confuses black epistemology, experience, and narrative authority with making just a few new black friends. So while Ray Spriggle rarely gets the credit he deserves as the, as the first post-war journalist to impersonate blackness, John Howard Griffin, have we all heard of John Howard Griffin? Raise your hand if you've heard of Griffin. Oh, only a couple? Never mind. Um, John Howard Griffin is often lauded as an empathy icon akin to the fictional Atticus Finch from Harper Lee's 1960 novel To Kill a Mockingbird. Griffin's still best-selling memoir, Black Like Me, is taught in junior high, high school, and university classrooms as an exemplar of cross-racial empathy. Sometimes it is taught in place of stories by actual black folks. Born as a self-described kind and genteel white Southerner on June 16, 1920 in Dallas, Texas, Griffin sutured his desire to experience empathetic racial impersonation with his devout Catholicism and disability. After losing his sight in a World War II injury, Griffin's decade-long but temporary blindness bolstered the myth about his own racial objectivity. He claimed, like many of my students at the beginning of the semester, the miraculous inability to see color. And therefore, the inability to never, ever, ever be racist. Griffin suggested he was incapable of racism, ignoring how racism is institutional. He became obsessed with the idea of racial impersonation as the only way a white man could know what blackness felt like after working on a research project on black suicide rates. Without ever acknowledging Spriggle, 
Griffin brought his supposedly groundbreaking idea to friend George Levitan, the owner of the black periodical Sepia. In 1959, Levitan greenlit the project by approving a six-part cover series for the magazine. Griffin, like Spriggle before him, decided to explore the South as a new black man. Before vitiligo corrective treatment, vitiligo is Michael Jackson's disease, um, topical stains, and a strong tanning lamp turned, grace, turned Griffin's face, hands, and torso brown, he fantasized his new black persona, a man named Joseph Franklin, in private unpublished journals. Becoming Franklin is part of um, Griffin's most closely held fears about empathetic racial impersonation. While Griffin publicly stated he would not ever change my name or identity and would merely change my pigmentation, the consequences of becoming Joseph haunted him and his new black psyche. Recalling the last conversation he had with his wife, Elizabeth, before his racial sojourn into oblivion, and that's what he called blackness, Griffin privately wrote in his journal, I feared she would always see herself after I came back, not black anymore, not with a Negro, but with a part nigger. Griff Griffin feared the imagined black Joseph persona would overwhelm his four decades living as white John, that this temporary empathetic racial impersonation would somehow undo his whiteness forever. Knowing those fears would not be palatable to his readers, Griffin, Griffin kept this racism to himself. Before Griffin first walked out into the New Orleans night as a Negro, and although he would never publicly admit it, Griffin met his new black self, Joseph Franken, in a, in a mirror rather than in public. He writes, I went to look at myself in the mirror. A fierce looking bald Negro glared at me from the glass. He in no way resembled me. The transformation was total and shocking. I knew then that I was not a disguised white man, but a newly created Negro who must go out and live in a world unfamiliar to him. Unlike Spriggle, who was good with a helpful chaperone, Griffin, traveling alone, faced a number of racist incidents, confirming his own investment in Dixie Terror. For example, young white thugs chased him, racist bus drivers wouldn't let him off the bus to pee, store managers refused to give him work, closeted white men sexually aggressed upon him while he hitchhiked, and most commonly, supposedly good white folks withered him with what he called the hate stare. In the most extreme example, after Griffin turned white again, racists from his hometown in Mansfield, Texas, hanged him in effigy. He and his family escaped to Mexico. However, even in exile, Griffin was insistent he acquired the experience and authority to be a mouthpiece for the black community. He spun his temporary experiment into a career-making exemplar of allyship. So Griffin's encounters with and de detailing of Jim Crow Dixie Terror worked. The sepia magazine articles were turned into the best-selling memoir, Black Like Me, in 1961. In 1964, enthusiastic moviegoers saw James Whitmore play another one of Griffin's personas, John Finley Horton this time, in the film version of the text. Actor Whitmore summed up what many appreciated about Griffin. John was as close to a saint as any man I knew. He also said, John was ahead of his time. In the hopeful future of imagined racial harmony, Griffin performs for many readers a representative tutorial on how to make that future possible. However flawed, Griffin remains instructive. Even when Griffin himself tried to psychically disavow the seeming permanence of his temporary blackness, ultimately, Griffin's empathetic racial impersonation represents a model of trying to bridge racial divides even though his method was deeply problematic. Griffin's importance to this genealogy of well-intentioned allies extends beyond middle schoolers reading Black Like Me instead of actual African-American literature to his predece predecessor and mentee, Grace Halsell. Halsell was born white in Lubbock, Texas in 1923. A self-described descendant of slaveholders and Civil War veterans, Halsell was changed after reading Griffin's memoir while working as a staff writer for the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. Quote, I bought Black Like Me and plunged into it, discovering that Griffin talked to me like an inner voice, calm, suggestive, she writes. Deeply moved, she concludes, I could do that. I could be Black. Halsell's timing was terribly ironic because it was 1969. 
By 1969, black separatists began to question and reject the place of white liberals in the civil rights movement, especially as that movement started to address issues beyond Southern segregation to include white supremacy, capitalism, and the US imperialism of the Vietnam War. Also, Stokely Carmichael had made strong articulations of black power three years prior. Even still, after meeting Griffin and getting his approval for her impersonation, and many people would have had asked Griffin if they could kind of do his progress over again, Halsa was the only one he said yes to. Um, Halsa decided to become a black woman first in Harlem and then in Mississippi. She initially imagined she would be black for a year. She only lasted six months. Halsa was not motivated by a desire to challenge the structural racial inequalities exposed by the heirs growing tumult. She had no grand aims of easing the escalating tensions of the late 1960s. Instead, she chose blackness, quote, to open my eyes, my mind, my pores to the dilemma of race in America, and to share my experiences, selfishly suggesting I needed this experience. Mimicking Griffin, Halsa used um, the same doctors to racially change her own body landscape to embark on what Griffin calls a kind of lady black like me in their private letters. Halsa took vitiligo corrective medication and baked herself caramel in the tropical suns of the Caribbean. Even before physically transforming herself black, Halsa began to learning how to perform blackness by enrolling in what could be described as John Howard Griffin's correspondence course, Empathetic Racial Impersonation 101. Responding to her queries on how to affect the identity in mind, Griffin offered this advice, quote, I think the best thing is to keep the story as near the truth as possible. We must avoid giving the racist the material to discredit you later. They will love to put on that you went there to Mississippi under false pretenses. While writing Halsell for her curtain call on the stage of black life, Griffin was motivated by the gendered insight Halsell could bring to a white leadership's understanding of black America. After all, Halsell writes, Black Like Me was written by a man. I wondered if it were possible for a white woman to expose herself to that mind-deadening malady of second-class citizenship and report its effects a dystopian and telling assumption about blackness in general and black womanhood specifically. Halsell did not consult not one black woman before temporarily becoming one. So there's white Halsell there and then as far as black Halsell. During Halsell's temporary black womanhood, she confronts gendered racial terror while working as a black domestic in the Wheeler home in Clarksdale, Mississippi. After a hurried Mrs. Wheeler ordered her to, quote, clean the commode, clean the tub, clean the floors, run the sweeper, do the washing, and do the ironing for the abysmally low daily wage of three bucks, Mr. Walker comes home and lures Halsell to an upstairs bedroom in order to rape her. In this harrowing scene, Halsell's blackness triggers Wheeler's fantasies of the lascivious and available Jezebel. In the presence of her black woman body, Wheeler performs an eager lecherousness, revealing his part in the well-rehearsed scripts dictating the interactions between white men and black women in the precarious space of the domestic. The violent consequences of House's assumed blackness expose the very real precariousness of black women, particularly those working and living as domestics in the South. Rather than reveal the truth of her body, Halso escapes back into whiteness after releasing herself from the grip of her attacker with the literal and symbolic force of bourgeois respectability, the family portrait that hung above the bed, a portrait that undoubtedly witnessed Wheeler's other rapes and attempted rapes. Halso believes herself to be uniquely resistant, imbued with a legitimacy she assumes is lacking in black women who have survived sexual violence and assault. Knowing she does not need the wages from her temporary domestic work, and also knowing her blackness is merely temporary, Halsell challenges her attempted rapist. As she taunts her perpetrator, she does so with a defiance she assumes most black women in similar situations would not have the economic opportunity to display. She, quote, she writes, traditionally, if the Negro woman wants to keep a job, she all too frequently has to submit to the white man's desires, but not me. Here and throughout her impersonation, Halsell constructs herself as unique, um, creating a false history that obscures black women, their stories, and their particular resistance to sexual violence. Posi positioning herself as someone who can speak for her, quote, darker sisters, and that's what she calls them, 
in her 1969 memoir, Soul Sister. And despite the fact that the book is often overshadowed by Griffin's Black Like Me, Hassel continued to invest in the potential of empathetic racial impersonation. After blackness, Hassel went on to become a Navajo woman, publishing Bessie Yellowhair in 1973. She didn't stop there. She then feigned non-citizenship and crossed the US-Mexico border multiple times as an undocumented Mexican migrant worker for the illegals in 1978. So there's a large chronological leap in this genealogy between Halsell's soul sister and the next iteration of empathetic racial impersonation, um, the 2006 cable network show Black White. Um, empathetic racial impersonation, in the way that I'm talking about it, seemed to all but disappear for a while. However, it is empathy and not racial impersonation that fell immediately from view. Racial impersonation, a long entrenched hallmark of how Americans perform and practice identity through appropriations of blackness from black face minstrelsy in the mid 19th century to hip hop culture in the 21st, is an important corollary to this particular genealogy. Racial impersonation continued to dominate our racial, legal, and popular cultural landscapes during this apparent, apparent disappearance. There was Melvin Van Peebles' satiric film, Watermelon Man, 1960, the 1986 teen comedy Soul Man, and the 1990 critically and commercially panned Heart Condition starring Bob Hoskins and Denzel Washington. These cinematic renderings are corollaries to this genealogy providing how racial impersonation always haunts our racial and cultural imaginaries. While these films bridge the gaps between Spriggle Griffin Housel and Black White, a young white University of Maryland college student, oh no, that's not him, ah, named Joshua Solomon, represents the closest example of empathetic racial impersonation in this interim period. In 1994, Solomon medically dyed his skin to become a black man after unsurprisingly reading John Howard Griffin's Black Like Me. His originally planned month-long experiment only lasted a few days. There he is, black. Enough is enough, he wrote for the Washington Post so only two days in. I didn't need to be hit over the head with a baseball bat to understand what was going on here. Usually I'd made friends pretty easily. I was nice to them and they were nice to me. Now people acted like they hated me. Nothing changed with the color of my skin. Housel's doctor, Aaron B. Lerner, had turned Solomon from a white boy to someone who he thought looked Haitian. All right, Solomon. <laughs> Black White premiered on Wednesday, March 8, 2006. Advertised as a true conversation about race in the United States and the ultimate racial experiment. Black White provided audiences the opportunity to watch empathetic racial impersonation on a scale never before attempted. Instead of one individual heroically crossing the line, the show featured two typical American families, the born black Sparks, see if my, that's the, that's the Sparks, and the born white Wurgles, so there's um, the Sparks are Brian in the center, and then um, Renee, the mom, and son Nick. Let's go back and get the Wurgles. Um, um, born white Wurgles, Bruno, Carmen, and daughter Rose. And they were to come, become, oh, there are the Wurgles again. Um, the Sparks, the born black Sparks, they are now in white face, and the Wurgles in black. For six weeks, the families not only performed versions of each otherness, but also lived together in Los Angeles, California, processing and discussing their experiences under the hyper surveillance that is now the hallmark of reality television. What makes black white so provocative, particularly for this genealogy, is its visuality. Unlike Spriggle, Griffin, Housel, and even Solomon, we can see the cast of the show's full transformation. The whole scene is on DVD. I'll warn you, the show is not good, so. <laughs> These slides are all you need to know about it. For an entire year, the cast and crew endured a grueling process of polymer head castings, repeated pigment tests on the skin, and traditional methods of Hollywood cosmetics, such as prosthetic features and stereotypically racialized hair. The transformations were so impressive 
the makeup team won a 2006 Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Makeup for a Series Non-Prosthetic. And they were particularly happy with the trans transformation of Born Black Renee into White Renee. Because she had um, thicker lips that they had to deal with. They were very proud about that. Okay. Race is an experience of being, performance, and persona, but this tedious process reminds how in the domain of the visual, it is also imagined, constructed, and fashioned. The six-part series awkwardly moves between private, in-house, interracial, and fam familial conflicts to public performances of newly embodied racial identities. For example, born black patriarch, now white Brian, goes golfing and gets a job bartending at a white bar. Born black matriarch, now white Renee, attempts to scrapbook. She doesn't like it. And born black son, now white Nick, attends photography and etiquette classes while in whiteface. Meanwhile, born white patriarch in the show's villain, Bruno, tries to buy a car, recklessly, recklessly uses the word nigger, and obnoxiously attempts to rap while newly black. Born white matriarch Carmen buys dashikis a lot and abuses African-American vernacular English. Born white daughter Rose, now black Rose, the show's liberal and transformative hope eventually articulates the limits of the project after not feeling included in her all black um, slam poetry group. And when she was with the group, she was completely made up to look black. Um, I quote her now rather extensively. And she's um, kind of unloading on her mom here. It's a very emotional scene. They're all crying. I didn't feel like I was part of the group. Honest to God, I don't feel like people are clicking with me. And I understand it, but like, I'm not, I'm not black. I'm not black. You can't act black. You are black. There are just some things you can't be a part of if you're not a part of it. And for some reason, like just before this project, I didn't understand that, you know, why people couldn't get along in ways. And I realized, like, you can have a black best friend if you're white, but you meet in a middle ground. I don't have that history. And as much as, like, white me can feel like it's history, it's not just history. It's what you grow up with. It is who they are. It taught me. And that is the one crazy piece of this project, that you become invisible. You're somewhat into the world, but you're like flirting with the boundary because you're not black and they'll feel it, end quote. Unable to shoulder the burden of impersonation, Rose came out as white to her poetry classmates in only the second episode. Although the creators of the show make it clear in the DVD commentary, they're walking in the footsteps of John Howard Griffin, he's mentioned specifically, updating his empathetic racial impersonation for the 21st century by adding family dynamics and reality TV, by the end of the show, the two families are seething in miscommunication and microaggressions, barely speaking to each other. Ultimately, black, white, uncomfortably and unintentionally bumps against the limit of cross-racial empathy, a limit found at the level of intimacy. The show is not about racial violence or Dixie terror. It's about quietly clutched, clutched purses, coincidentally missing job applications, and fearfully averted eyes stuff difficult to catch, even by ever-present television cameras. The show's precious nuances of racial intimacy are instead about the banal, the everyday, and the covert. As a reality show, like I said, super boring. Despite the dramatic makeup, during the final episode, viewers are left with a bleak reality. Interracial proxies fail to change the systemic and institutional. Part four, can't we all just get along? Okay, so remember how we put a pin in my best friend's mom's comments? Let's take that pin out. I wish I knew what it was like to be black. Now we know that Nini, sorry, not sorry for using her real name, is not the only one deploying that sentiment. I see that comment on social media all the time, particularly after acts of racial terror like Charlottesville or Charleston. It's a statement that is supposed to be comforting, a well-intentioned gesture of empathy and cross-racial understanding. The hungry, I wish I knew, is a burgeoning white ally mental exercise. I am thinking about you, it tries to say. I want you to know I'm not like them, it suggests. It is well-intentioned, but still mired in unproductive white liberal guilt. However, 
good white folks sometimes need me, like me needed, to absolve them, and they effectively dump their racial guilt into my lap. It's a rehearsed move. Often when good white folks seek absolution, they project the responsibility of their privilege and its consequences onto folks of color. What can I do? But you just have to show me. And good bl black folks are expected to play their part in this cross-racial game. Thank yous and I appreciate you are expected. I know you weren't part of this or an added bonus. Don't, never, don't worry, I don't, never thought you were like them. These comforting phrases expunge good white folk from the actions of bad white folk. Read folks with tiki torches. Unfortunately, comforting texts, hugs, and well wishes will not undo white supremacy or undo privilege. Racism is an institutionalized system. We can't just hug it out, though many have tried. Although Nobel Prize winning economist Gunnar Myrdal concluded that the social so solution to the Negro problem was a moral issue resting in the hearts of white Americans in his overwhelmingly popular two volume sociological tome, An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in a Modern Democracy in 1944, Myrdal sold us all out. Real empathy is an undoing. And when seemingly kind but counterfeit allies deploy the precious pronoun I, they do so without realizing that in that I, we, and my me, gets erased. Part five, stubborn allies. I know, right? In the summer of 2015, a video went viral starting the clock on a relentless 15 minutes of fame. During an in in interview with an NBC affiliate, Rachel Dolezal failed to answer a seemingly straightforward question from reporter Jeff Humphrey. Are you African American? Rachel paused for three very long, very agonizingly awkward seconds. Without answering, she walked away. In my book, I call Dolezal with a nod to Housel, the last soul sister. She is my frustrating conclusion to this gene genealogy because before her, I could easily make the claim that empathetic racial impersonators always turned back white, that impersonation was always temporary, but not with Dolezal. As a white woman self-identifying as black, Dolezal de demonstrates how a well-versed liberal white woman attempts to renounce her biological claims to whiteness and white privilege under the alibi of good intentions, empathy, allyship, activism, and familial intimacy. Dolezal refuses the temporary blackness of others in this genealogy. It's not a costume, she says. It's not something that I can put on and take off anymore. During the social and mainstream media sc scandals Dolo's racial outing inspired, Rachel left a racial wake in her path. Everyone scrambled to understand why a once blonde white lady would willingly abs abscond that identity to attempt impersonating black womanhood. With limited racial imagination, many folk cl claimed no one would want to be ever black. Think paces rained down, podcasts has actually hosted emergency episodes. It seemed everyone was trying to wrap their brains around a new racial theory, transracial identity. Folks were shook. The only person who seemed unfazed by all the theoretical scrambling around race and identity was Dolezal herself. Although she has lost both employment and social standing, to this day, Dolezal remains steadfast in her fake blackness. She has told numerous media outlets in some, I always imagined myself black. I drew myself with a brown crayon when I was young. I have black sons. I'm spiritually and instinctively black. While Dolezal might feel instinctively black, I refuse to consider her what we call transracial because its theory, theorization so easily falls apart. Transracial is exclusively one directional from black to white. No, I'm sorry, from white to black. In its ill logic, blackness becomes the space of racial play, performance, and affect, whereas whiteness does not. If a person of color felt an instinctive or spiritual connection to whiteness, that feeling would never fully guarantee the protection of white privilege. If the police stopped a person of color uh, black men like either of my brothers, for example, don't shoot, I identify as white, would never be a viable alibi. Ultimately, Rachel Dolezal is the most American of white folks. In full Gatsby style, she maintains her assumed American birthright. The birthright allows her to, as she has recently stated multiple times, completely self-identify. How privileged of her.
And she's right in her rightness, even while dyeing her spray tan and her very convincing wigs, weaves, and braids, Del Ozal is unapologetically white. However, what I appreciate about Del Ozal is how she gives us a teachable moment and not the one on trans race. In a strange way, this white woman's stubborn commitment to what black means in our not post-racial but most racial moment reinforces nearly paradoxically how much I love being black. Loving my blackness allows me to be selfish. So I want to close by cleaving to the idea that recognizing another person's pain is possible and visiting the landscapes of difference can be meaningful and rich. Although this genealogy of empathetic racial impersonation has often meant power, privilege, stereotype, stubbornness, and erasure, it also teaches us about the hazards of racialization and the naive but sincere search for cross-racial understanding. Although this genealogy about walking in someone else's skin exposes the limits of empathetic racial impersonation, these racial stunts also demonstrate how identity is shifting and contingent. We must continue to crave an epistemology of empathy. Thank you. <laughs>